Works. On behalf of writer-director Sina Murad Friedman and executive producer Will Lucas, thank you so much for tuning in. Well, it's been quite a journey to get to this day, producing a documentary with a national focus in a pandemic that would be engaging and informative was a real challenge. However, delivering a meaningful message became paramount to us. The pandemic, the brutal murder of George Floyd and other high profile killings of people of color by those who took an oath to protect and serve the residents of a community really underscored how the issue we're addressing in this documentary is playing out and magnified why zip code matters. A special thank you to the individuals who gave freely of their time, expertise, insight, support, and encouragement in the making of this film. Richard Rothstein, author of The Color of Law. Devon Russell, president of the Women's Housing and Economic Development Corporation in the Bronx. United States Senator Sherrod Brown. Jason Richardson from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Civil rights activist Stella Adams. Attorney Steve Dane. Cheryl Frost Brown of the National Fair Housing Alliance. Dr. Tiffany Manuel, social scientist and president of The Case Made, Kendra Smith, Bon Secours Mercy Healthcare System, Kate Sommerfeld, head of the Social Determinants of Health Institute at the ProMedica Healthcare System, and Marie Flannery, president and CEO of the Fair Housing Center in Toledo. Some additional thank yous. None of this would have been possible without the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which made funding for this project possible. Thank you also to the Fair Housing Center. Little did the Fair Housing Center know when it planned this film two years ago, how timely it would be. And you know, on a personal note, this project was particularly special to me because my mother, Ara Blakeney, worked in fair housing and was with the uh, center at a time when some incredibly groundbreaking work was coming from the center in Toledo and having a national impact. So thank you, Senna, for bringing me into the fold. What an incredible opportunity. So please stick around after the film for the Q&A, it'll be great. And with that, Will, Let's roll tape. Your zip code, where you live, can have a profound effect on many uh, life determinants, jobs, education, health, and so forth. What your zip code is, is a determinant of the access that you're going to have. I mean, despite all the advancements in things like transportation and communication, where you live is still a very strong predictor of how far you're going to go in terms of both building wealth and staying healthy. For me, as a social scientist, it, it makes total sense to me that like we've known for a very long time that the environments around us actually shape a good deal of our experiences. And the benefit, I think, of having this conversation about zip code is that it's a trigger device sort of mentally to force us to think about those environments around us. What you're really asking is why does the quality of the resources in a neighborhood matter? And there are many reasons for that. Let's take one that I've spent a lot of time talking about, and that's educational outcomes. If uh, you have a area, a neighborhood, which is poorly resourced, for example, which has um, lots of pollution because it's near industrial sites, has diesel trucks driving through it, has um, dilapidated buildings and vermin in the environment and empty lots kicking up dust. If you have all those conditions in the neighborhood in which you live, children are going to perform more poorly in school. Children who live in neighborhoods like that, and they're particularly African-American children living in low-income neighborhoods, have asthma at four times the rate of middle-class children. Four times the rate. They have asthma because of all those conditions I just mentioned, pollution, diesel trucks, dilapidated buildings, and so forth. And if a child has asthma, the child is more likely than other children to come to school drowsy the next day because they've been up at night wheezing. So if you have two groups of children who are identical in every respect, 
same racial breakdown, same social and economic background, same family structure. But one group lives in a neighborhood where they have a higher rate of asthma. That group is going to do more poorly in school. You know, in this country, a lot of our schools are funded via property taxes. So neighborhoods, zip codes that are higher income, uh, the homes are more expensive. And so the property tax funds generated are greater. Um, therefore, their schools have access to a larger amount of money. Um, whereas in a low to moderate income neighborhood, the homes aren't as expensive and therefore don't generate as much property taxes. So those schools are under-resourced. Well, if a child you know, comes from a school that lacked the resources, then they're starting life um, already behind. I'm aware of two school systems where they, one, they red light, green light, and yellow light students when they enter kindergarten, pre-K. They haven't been given a crayon by a school system, and yet they are labeled, based on zip code, a red light student, which means no potential, a yellow light student, we might be able to teach them something, and a green light student, they should be prepared and ready to learn. We know that African Americans have shorter life expectancies, greater rates of cardiovascular disease because they live in less well-resourced neighborhoods, the absence of grocery stores that sell fresh food, the absence of medical facilities, primary care physicians who don't practice in those neighborhoods. That contributes to it as well. And in one key zip code, 10452, here are some stats. 34% of the population smokes. Over 50% are obese. 42% suffer with high blood pressure. Kids in elementary school through middle school are at a 35% attainment level. The high school graduation rate is below 60%. Within a mile and a half stretch that covers one, two, three, four train subway stops, there are three McDonald's, a Burger King, a Wendy's, a Domino's, and a Little Caesars. Your zip code is a better determinant of your health than your DNA or your genetic code. And I think we've seen that as we look at how this health pandemic has impacted folks more who live in certain neighborhoods than others. So what's interesting more and more as researchers are looking at the impact of zip code, what we're seeing in many of our cities, almost 50 of the top 500 cities across the country, we're seeing variances in life expectancy up to 20 years. So when you start to map that out, what we know is that place matters, the physical place, the resources, the supports matter of communities. And so it really makes us think hard about how we're addressing health and well-being, but also as a community, how we're making investments in things like preschool, um, ensuring that all kids have access to high quality preschool, that we have a healthy housing stock, that we're addressing issues like lead poisoning that, that often occurs in the housing stock of our communities. When you see a neighborhood which is consistently the, the site of disinvestment, in other words, where banks won't lend money, where businesses can't operate, then you're also gonna find a confluence of other negative effects in those areas, including uh, lower life, shorter lifespans, greater likelihood of suffering from chronic disease, um, a higher level of social vulnerability, which is CDC measurement of the vulnerability of the population to things like disease outbreaks, such as COVID-19. So all of these uh, factors we're finding are, are interrelated. I know of people who have actually died. Just think of it in this pandemic, because of where you live, which is the, the uh, result of discriminatory housing patterns, they're people who are now no longer with us. But transportation is another uh, aspect of the disadvantage that many uh, low-income, segregated neighborhoods have. Uh, typically, uh, young men, uh, 
men uh, of any age really and women don't have access to good jobs from those neighborhoods because there's no transportation available we don't uh, create the kind of public transportation that's necessary uh, we invest a lot of money in highways to bring suburban white middle-class families into urban areas so that they can uh, go to the theater or get to, to uh, white-collar jobs but we don't invest in the kind of public transportation that would bring residents of segregated low-income neighborhoods to good jobs if we know that people have dreams about going to college or other trade schools and they can't get to it that's a barrier if we know that folks want to work in certain industries and there's no public transit to get them there from their zip code, from their community, we're creating barriers. And so I think it's really about the opportunities that are limited because we haven't taken the time to build up zip codes and communities in the way that they best serve those that live there. And there's a lot of cities in this country um, that uh, public transportation is not necessarily regional. So therefore, um, you know, and a lot of the jobs would be, you know, across into the next county or something like that, still close, but there's no public transportation that goes there. And so if you can't get to the job, then, um, you know, how are you going to, um, how are you going to be able to work there? Perhaps one of the most powerful policies that the federal government uh, imposed in order to create the segregation that we know today, the concentration of African-Americans in lower income neighborhoods, was a policy that the Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration followed after World War II. Uh, in those years, they had an explicit racial program to move all white working class, lower middle class families out of urban areas into single family homes in all white suburbs. The Federal Housing Administration and Veterans Administration even required the developers of the suburbs that ring every city in this country today to place a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. And those clauses in the deed still exist today. Well, those homes that was built in the mid 20th century after World War II for returning war veterans primarily, but for all working class white families, uh, were inexpensive. They cost $8,000, $9,000 a piece. In today's money, that's about $100,000. Those homes no longer cost $100,000 uh, today. As you know, they cost, depending on the region of the country, three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, in some places, a million dollars and more. The result is that today, African-American incomes on average are about 60%, 60% of white incomes. You'd think that if people have similar incomes, they'd have similar wealth. But in fact, while African-American household incomes on average are about 60% of white incomes, African-American wealth is about 5% of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 5% wealth ratio is entirely attributable the unconstitutional federal housing policies that were practiced in the mid-20th century and that have been remedied. One of the most significant means of building wealth in our country is home ownership. And yet, where you live, your zip code can in fact have both a positive and a negative effect on your ability to build wealth through home ownership. If we could get higher rates of home ownership in those neighborhoods, there is a greater chance that African Americans and other minorities can build the type of wealth that the rest of America, particularly white America, builds. 75% of white families in the U.S. own a home. Just 49% of black families uh, do so. Money you put into your house eventually turns into equity that you can withdraw in a variety of ways. A lot of that money winds up getting passed on to your children, either in the form of, of education or get you know just just uh, um, you know investment in housing for them. For folks that you know aren't coming into to generational wealth that aren't being left that type of wealth, not being able to purchase a home in a place that will gain value is the ultimate you know, deterioration of somebody's wealth. And so when we think about the practice of redlining, you know, every community has value, every community has worth. And if we invest it and allow potential homeowners to invest it in it in the right way, 
their wealth will raise, the property values will raise. It really is this wave of community impacts that can happen. And so it really is the most detrimental way that financially we're keeping people down and unsuccessful. You can, um, you can go back a couple of decades and look at a map of Cleveland or a map of Washington where I am right now or a map of damn near anywhere and you can see you can see redlining and you can go back decades before that to Jim Crow and decades before that to black codes and decades before that to slavery. I mean you could you can see how um, this is all this is all connected that way. You cannot ignore slavery and have this discussion. Uh, slavery is, uh, and the downstream consequences of our failure to address the state of slavery continue to echo today. I am of African descent, right? I mean, if you trace my, my lineage, I'm somewhere from Western Africa. You know, they grabbed us from there and brought us over on a ship. And here we are in, in the Caribbean and in, in, in the United States. If you go back to some of those communities where I'm from genetically, they ain't suffering from high blood pressure and obesity and some of the things that we are suffering with here. Genetically, we have the same makeup, but that's not what has led us here. What has led us here is in communities that have been redlined after slavery was abolished, Jim Crow, the Civil Rights Act, all of this stuff has happened. We are still in segregated ghettos in America. And what happens in those neighborhoods is that resources are scarce and non-existent. Investment is scarce and non-existent. Opportunities for getting out are scarce and non-existent. And we have a problem. And redlining where, where banks literally in those days would draw a red line around areas they weren't going to loan to, you can still see it um, driving down the street. If you live in a neighborhood that was redlined in the 1930s, that means that a pattern was established at the time where banks refused to lend money for housing. The downstream consequences of that are that the housing itself is in worse shape. It's, it's worth less money, it's typically in worse uh, repair, and it's hard to borrow money against it even. In predominantly minority neighborhoods, home values are typically lower. That is a consequence of historical racial discrimination, both from uh, government policies and from private real estate discrimination, racial steering and racial redlining by financial institutions. People have pointed out the fact that we are segregated and have tried to do several things to correct that. But what's happened? Most recently, a year and a half ago, in a zip code that governs the Upper West Side of Manhattan. This is where people who probably make upwards of 150 to millions of dollars a year were being asked to accept into their super high functioning schools, 25% of the kids of a neighboring zip code. So this is now above 96th Street. So now you're talking about West Harlem, and where kids are not as affluent and we're not doing as well on standardized, uh, standardized tests. To accept some of these kids into their prime middle school as a way for a better integration, which is proven to help. And there was a major uproar amongst the residents of the Upper West Side. And this includes people who are brown, black, affluent, white, the mix. And that tells us something. So what Opportunity Zones offer is a way to push in to some of these pre-existing systems in a way that could be beneficial to everybody, especially for kids who are, you know, um, or people who have been marginalized. I think it's really hard to pinpoint the exact place where discrimination is happening, but when we look at things like unemployment data or disparity indexes that tell us how diverse communities are, it's very clear that we still have a lot of work to do. And I think part of our opportunity is to really think about 
How do we invest in things that people are telling us that they need and want, putting them in places where they tell us they want to be and making sure that they can be successful while they're there. And so eventually we'll start to see those disparity indexes close and we'll start to see unemployment go down and we'll start to see financial stability and net worth rise. And I think that's how we'll really know that discrimination is on its, it's, it's, on its way out and that we're really doing a good job of, of turning the tide in that space. I am a fourth generation college educated black woman. They exist, right? I thought everybody's life was like that. Home ownership is an expectation. It's not something in my affluent black neighborhood. Everybody owns a home. That's nothing new. Um, everybody has an expectation. You're going to go to college and you're going to do something with your life. That's not new. We lit when we sought to live in a zip code that um, matched the financial gains we were denied that opportunity um at first but my mother and father were the first black family in the white neighborhood the discrimination we felt was um incredible uh, until we moved in when you lived in the neighborhood you had an automatic membership to the country club that was a part of the community when they found out we were moving in, they voted to make it private. Well, I'm not suggesting to you that the police would never discriminate against African-Americans if uh, so many uh, low-income black families weren't concentrated in single poorly resourced neighborhoods. But it's much, much worse because of that. When you concentrate the most disadvantaged young men in single neighborhoods without access to good jobs or transportation to get to them or um, uh, schools with high achievement or any of the other conditions I've just described, the police assume the stance of an occupying force and develop uh, policies and practices, stop and frisk, for example, which would never be tolerated in a, a middle-class neighborhood. So I don't think policing ever sets out to be inequitable or unequal in, in at its core, but I think what we find is that whether it's implicit bias, whether it's lack of communication, whether it's lack of trust building, it really goes to impact our, on how police and community interact. And when those relationships aren't strong, we get instances where it seems like populations of people are being targeted or communities are being targeted or police feel that they're not making any traction. And I think we really have to think about how we better bridge that communication gap to say, you know, we're here to, to keep you safe. We want to be safe. How do we work together to really create the safest communities that we can and help those relationships grow? And I think we'll start to see some of that implicit bias, some of that perceived dis discrimination start to go away. So certainly in today's environment, it requires us to take a very hard look in the mirror about systemic and institutional racism. How both within healthcare, we know that there's significant racism that's happening um, both inside our four walls, but also as communities and how we're making investments in things like housing, um, how we're supporting individuals around education, how we're funding education, both at the federal, the state and the local level. When you ask ordinary folks, you and I, right, what are the things that you want to see in your community that help you be healthy? Like they, we can take them off really quickly. We can go like, yep, 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 yep. And then when you ask people like, does that exist in your community? It actually takes people a moment to sort of go, oh, wait, I think, we, I think we have other, right? So, so we're not actively kind of in the conversation and in the thought process of like, does my community represent ideally like what it means to have a thriving place? And if if so, great. How do I contribute to make sure those things are sustained? And if not, how do I get those things in my community, right? Zip code is a, is a construction of the post office. It's a, the efficient way in which they uh, deliver mail. It really doesn't have anything to do with the, the inequality that we have between the races. Uh, in this country. It's a nice uh, uh, gimmick to try to tell people that where you live matters, but I would prefer to, to say not your zip code matters, but your neighborhood matters, because that's what we're really talking about. Some zip codes might be all affluent, some zip codes might be all low income, and some span the, the two. 
the so zip codes themselves are not a um, a useful way to think of the differences uh, and the inequality that we have uh, in Toledo or anywhere else. Historical patterns have not changed. The the redlining, the impact of redlining, the impact this federal government has had and continues to have in segregating our communities and perpetuating um, segregation. It's as if they've crumpled up that wonderful paper that is your life and they've thrown it down on the ground and stomped on it because they didn't think that you were good enough. And even though you took that paper up and you straightened it up, the creases are still in there. That blot is still in there. For some people who experience housing discrimination, it is like that. I kind of the understanding that it's not just about investment, it's not just about redlining, it's about all of these other factors such as public health and education and policing, and they, they, that they all relate to these same core issues, which are, you know, when you, when you have a pattern of disinvestment that, that uh, creates these racially concentrated areas of poverty, then those become kind of these nexus points for all of these other negative impacts. There are very few legislative efforts being worked on uh, to heal past inequality. Uh, we have a Fair Housing Act that we passed in 1968 that prohibits ongoing discrimination. But because of the conditions I described before, the wealth gap, for example, it doesn't do any good to prohibit ongoing discrimination if we've created a situation where African-American segregated families don't have the wealth to be able to be discriminated against. They can't move to highly resourced neighborhoods in the first place. We know that we have to meet immediate basic social needs. If someone is struggling with housing or food, we need to connect them to the right resources and supports. Um, but we also need to take a longer term approach and really drive structural changes to change policy systems and environmental change. Um, and so it's really, again, those immediate basic needs, but also making sure we're using our voice to have a longer term view and driving some of the, the larger issues across communities as well. What I'm excited about in this current moment, quite frankly, is the opportunity to undo that. If we made those systems, right, we can remake them um, in a way that actually makes it so that, like, what does it take to make all of us make those systems, like, really balance that out so that we all have an opportunity to succeed? What does that look like? So when you ask the question about what does it tell us about communities that are thriving, that are well-resourced, and those that are not, I say, we know how to do it, <laughs> right? There's a blueprint right there. Let's get busy. This is an issue of, this is an issue of will, a public and political will, not an issue of the, the knowledge to do what we need to do. How do we invest in the community around us? So we saw a lot of dilapidated housing in this community, and so we wanted to make that investment with our partners. We know that if folks are able to and interested in working at the hospital, this is a walkable neighborhood to a major employer. So we invested in job training. We're investing in financial stability and really saying, how do we take one core neighborhood and invest in layer and leverage resources in a way that we're fulfilling the vision that the community has created. We worked on, in my community back in Illinois, was housing, housing and recreation, because housing is so central to everything. So whatever we can do to correct the inequities that we see in housing, the discrimination that we see in housing, is for me the first step. Neighborhoods, zip codes, are not invested in equally or with equity. So when we see disparities in housing or people being able to access commercial or retail services, food, uh, social services in an imbalanced way, that is really how zip codes have the ability to be impacted and, and, and really have negative impacts on people's health, their social determinants, and they're really their stability. So we have got to take the stigma off of these zip codes. We have got to invest in um, communities in a way that is um, reparative, in a way that provides for equity, not equality.
Welcome back. Let's meet our panelists. Jason Richardson is the Director of Research and Evaluation at the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Hello, Jason. Dr. You. Tiffany Manuel is a social scientist and president and CEO of The Case Made. Devon Russell is the president of the Women's Housing and Economic Development Corporation, also known as WEDCO. Uh, Kendra Smith is the Vice President of Community Health at Bon Secours Mercy Health. And Kate Sommerfeld is President of the Social Determinants of Health Institute at ProMedica Healthcare Systems. Thank you all for uh, being a part of this Q&A. There's, there, there's, there's a lot to explore here. And, you know, Jason, I'm going to begin with you. Uh, Devon talked about this, as did Senator uh, Brown of Ohio, and you were point blank saying, quote, you cannot ignore slavery and have this discussion. Now, your comments stayed with me because so often we hear, well, that was 150 years ago. We're, we're past that now. So why is it critical to acknowledge slavery? Because it, um, the, the roots of all of the, the disparities that we look at have to be tied to it directly. You had legal slavery followed by Jim Crow, followed by redlining, followed by you know, segregation and, and, a, and a host of other policies and practices. But the root of it was the unfair beginning and the, the unwillingness to, to deal with the disparity in, in, in opportunity that slavery imparted. And as long as we continue to ignore that, I, I don't see a, a way to resolve many of uh, the, the problems that, that your film talks about. And, you know, as we heard, um, Richard Rothstein said that there are very few legislative efforts being worked on to heal past inequality, pointing out that the Fair Housing Act was passed in 1968, which uh, likely could use some updating. That said, are you aware of any efforts or solutions banks are coming up with to redress redlining, disinvestment, or other uh, unfair lending practices? Jason, that's I'm sorry. Uh, you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was muted there. I forgot. Um, a lot of banks are, are working on it. You know, in in the the um, we work with a lot of banks to talk to them about uh, the the level of lending to to low to moderate income neighborhoods, minority majority neighborhoods, or high minority neighborhoods, and lending to uh, to minority borrowers and to LMI borrowers. And we've entered into community benefits agreements with a number of lenders to, to help monitor their lending to those communities and help increase them. Uh, in fact, we just announced a new uh, $88 million community benefits agreement with PNC Bank this week that we're really proud of. Um, our, our CRA campaign team did a fantastic job there. So yeah, we're seeing interest there. But I, I think more broadly, when I talk about you know d discussing you know uh, the roots of slavery and how that impacts you know the, this discussion, what I'm saying is that that you know we, we still have to see the a dedicated uh, you know, federal level you know commitment to ending these things and reversing the the harmful policies. And, and keep in mind, slavery itself was a harmful policy. All right, we talk about redlining you know because it's in the modern era, but 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 slavery itself was a government policy at the time. So, you know, in, until we see, uh, uh, you know, that level of commitment, I, I don't know that that, uh, that, that that private industry has really the, the, uh, the scale to make that kind of impact that we're hoping for. So commitment at the federal level. And so I'll just throw this out there and, and anybody can answer, uh, either one of you can answer uh, this question. So um, anything uh, in, encouraging that you heard from President Biden last night or the fact that you know, we have this new administration that is amenable to having this discussion and actually uh, it can move the needle on this issue. I mean, I think the fact that, you know, in a national speech to Congress, that he was mentioning the things that he was mentioning, I think just even being able to have the conversation now, I think it's a lot different to have a solutions based conversation. Um, and I think we need to get there. But I think the fact that in that room, in that space, in that moment, we're talking about certain types of social determinants in and of itself is a win. Devon, what about you? Anything encouraging uh, that you that you see? And and actually, have you heard anything at the uh, the state, the local level, the state, local, or federal level? 
I, like Kendra, I agree that, um, you know, the fact that we're having some of these conversations and the fact that, you know, when it comes to some material gains, if some of what uh, the president is proposing are put into play and are implemented, we could see, you know, material gains for, for, for black and brown people. Obviously, it's a it's a mountain to climb. And like Jason, I don't look at any of this without examining what we need to do first. So this would be great. You know, not gonna, you know, you know, diminish the the effort, but we have a ton of work to do. At a state level in New York, you know, we we see, you know, we kind of look at ourselves as being super progressive here in New York. And so a lot of things are happening uh, in, in, a, in many ways to address some of this, but still, I don't believe we're being bold enough. But there's, there's some uh, optimism. And, you know, Devon, if quickly tell me about WEDCO. What does WEDCO do in a couple of seconds? And actually, I'm going to ask all of you to tell me a little bit just uh, about the work you do in the organization such a web. So, so WEDCO is a community-based, you know, non-for-profit. We're based in the South Bronx. And we believe and are, you know, motivated by this very simple idea that people deserve to live in neighborhoods that are thriving neighborhoods. And we believe that uh, stable housing is uh, the bedrock of, of this thriving. And so we set out to build, develop, you know, affordable housing, truly affordable housing that's beautiful. And then we work with the community to build a community that is thriving. Dr. Manuel, the case made. Yeah, I'm happy to happy to talk a little bit about that, and and also to just just circle back on this conversation about uh, what I'm hearing in the Biden administration. The case made is an organization that helps people make the case for change. Um, I think sometimes we we think that we're making a strong case for change as we talk about some of these issues, and a lot of what we have to say about, especially about housing, ends up directly backfiring in ways that makes it harder for us to actually get people to lean forward on the hard stuff. And we're talking about how do you deal with racial segregation and single family zoning and the stuff that are, can, can be very complicated for folks to understand, but we need broader public support in order to move, right? Some of the mountains that are, exist. So we really help people sort of reimagine, we call, what we call reimagine justice. How do you think carefully about how you're making the case for change and to use the bounty of social science to, to best understand how to share you know, how, how to get people to lean forward, right, when they might otherwise lean out. Um, and so in that, in the context of that, I think one of the things that I see as really powerful in this moment is being able to name the power of this moment for shaping the conversation. I think the Biden administration, um, much in part because it's being pushed to do so, is being much more explicit about issues of race, about issues of structural racism, they're catching a whole lot of flack because of it in some in some corners of the country. But I also think there's a, there are a lot of folks who've been wanting to have a frank, honest and open conversation about some of these issues and have been reticent to do so. And I think what we're starting to hear, at least at the, you know, at, at least in the broader form, right? An ability to have that conversation. Now, how long that lasts, we'll see, but at least we're having that conversation. It's anybody's guess. Uh, Kate, uh, t tell us about the Social Determinants of Health Institute. Yeah, thank you. And huge thank you to the Fair Housing Center uh, for putting the panel together. Honored to be with everybody today. Um, so I work for ProMedica. We're a health and well-being company, and I oversee our social determinants work. So just like we invest in clinical care, um, we make investments in housing, education, um, and other workforce development initiatives. So really believing that health is, is not only what happens inside of doctor's office, or inside of a hospital it really is broader than that. It is transportation and housing, all um, the issues that we've talked about tonight. I think relative to the Biden, I would just throw out one piece. Um, you know, we're, we've been working across the Toledo community really around universal preschool. You know, we see a lot of impact around preschool investments in particular um, and huge racial disparities in both the Toledo market, but also nationally. And so I think one piece of optimism um, is the commitment to universal preschool from the Biden administration. Um, lots of local community players in the Toledo market have been working hard along with the state of Ohio. So encouraged by that, um, it's certainly a long-term investment, but incredibly needed um, and is one positive step forward. And Kendra at Bon Secours Mercy Health. 
Sure. So Bon Secours Mercy Health um, is one of the largest Catholic nonprofit healthcare systems in the country. We serve um, seven states plus Ireland. Um, and, you know, for us, the, our community health team is really one of the forward facing teams that addresses not just social determinants, but also social needs. And we do that through community engagement and partnerships, through community investment, um, and really saying that in the same way we are going to care for our patients, we are also going to care for the places where our facilities are and people that live in those spaces, even if they're not our patient. And so I think to just broadly think about not just investing in, in people, uh, but also investing in place is really at the core of the work that we try to accomplish. Excellent. And Jason. Hi, the National Community Reinvestment Coalition was formed in 1990, and the, the purpose was to help increase the flow of capital into traditional, into, uh, traditionally underserved communities. I think today we've got about 600 member organizations across the country, and we help them with uh, training, policy support. Uh, we help them form coalitions to affect change locally and negotiate and talk with banks and lenders about increasing investment in those communities. And my team specifically supports members with, uh, with research support. We help them with data. We help them understand some of the data that they're looking at if, it doesn't, if it's not within their capacity. Um, we also have uh, housing counseling. We offer, we have a CDFI, we do fair lending testing. Um, there, there's a, and then of course we also meet with banks and we work out community benefits agreements to, to help them increase their, uh, you know, their, their impact in communities that we care about. So yeah, we, we do quite a bit of few things when I list them off like that, I guess. <laughs> it seems it caught you by surprise. You didn't realize you did so much. <laughs> I start listing them all. It's kind of, yeah. Okay. Well, we are good. Um, well, so I, Tiffany mentioned something very interesting about uh, what she thought was encouraging people who want to have the bold conversation now. And Kate, you spoke of the need for organizations to take a very hard look in the mirror when addressing systemic and institutional racism. What sort of internal work is your organization engaging in to try and begin to understand whether you're part of the solution and not the problem? And what corrective actions are you actually taking? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, obviously healthcare, um, there's longstanding mistrust that across healthcare in particular. Um, and so I think one of the, the moments for us, um, you know, quite frankly, we had never as a system taken an active stance um, around racial injustice. And with the murder of George Floyd, our CEO and board came out um, around support of that, but also a commitment to action. So we ended up naming our, our first chief diversity and equity inclusion officer um, and started over the last nine months have been really on a journey to understand and listen uh, more than anything. We have a, a long way to go. Um, again, both as an industry um, in building trust and showing up differently, investing differently, and providing different and better quality of care. You know, we see huge racial disparities around health in particular, you know, things like at infant mortality as an example. Um, and unfortunately, as we've made investments over the last decade in an issue like infant mortality, a baby dying for its first birthday, we're actually not seeing um, improvement in outcomes. If anything, we're seeing a disparity widen. Um, and so as an example, you know, for white babies, it's about six point six per thousand life births. Um, for African American babies, it's about 15.6 um, per thousand life births. So huge disparities, and yet that disparity is widening. And so as much as we um, you know, are showing up and investing differently, it's simply not enough. Um, we have to continue to really start to move the needle in a way that actually proves outcomes. Um, and we're today not seeing that, unfortunately. And so you you mentioned the importance of listening as as uh, as one of the the key steps. What other what other advice do you have for larger organizations or or healthcare systems like yours? Yeah. So one of the things that we're um, really focused on is building trust, and you know sometimes that uh, really is partnering and showing up in a different way. You know, a lot of our folks, um, you know, we can come into community, into neighborhoods, and we come in with our suits, um, and we really don't connect with with folks that we're serving. And so we've made some commitments to partner. Um, we've invested in local community based organizations um, to make sure that we're building trust, building authenticity in a different way. Um, and as much as you listen, and that's incredibly important, you also have to 
to actually act, right? Um, and so making investments and supporting things like um, a living wage. We made a commitment uh, to have a living wage for all of our employees um, across our entire system, making investments in wealth building strategies. So making sure that there's opportunity for workforce development, um, job opportunities. So it's both listening, trust, humility, but also um, putting your money where your mouth is and actually investing in, in a different way. And Kendra, I, I see you nodding because Von Secure did something uh, similar. If you can tell me a little bit about um, how you are investing in the community uh, mm -hmm. where you're where you're located. Yeah, you know, so I think what's so important is, you know, Dr. Manuel talked about this this instance of now, but the reality is Bon Secours um, as a health system has been investing in, in community for over 30 years, right? So as a health system, they have owned, they, we own 800 units of affordable housing in Baltimore. Um, we contribute to land banks and land trusts and, and all of these things has really been part of, of the Bon Secours Mercy Health model far before this became a hot topic. And so I think for us, especially in Toledo, you know, when you have a, a hospital that sits on a major corridor that is adjacent to neighborhoods, you can't help but connect with those residents and say, we're your neighbor, how can we help? How can we support? But I think the realization is that this work does not start and stop with large organizations. There are nonprofits that social determinants by another name is the mission of my nonprofit that has been in community for a hundred years, for 50 years, for you know however amount of time. And so I think for Bon Secours, our focus areas have really been on inclusive hiring, inclusive sourcing opportunities and community investment. And saying that we hear you say that people need jobs, that people need opportunities to grow their small businesses, but that there's also real infrastructure needs in community. And so through much like Kate, you know, talks about through listening, through partnership, through being a good partner and not needing to be at the head of every table, you know, we're able to support the work that's happening in our communities and, and use our balance sheet to to help impact, you know, the areas that are that are around us. Thank you, Tiffany. I see you nodding your head. Talk to us about good partnerships. What do what do parties need to understand about each other to make a partnership work? Yeah, and I was nodding exactly on that point, just to echo what Kendra said, just about the, you know, there there are organizations that have been in this in, in this conversation for a very long time and have owned their role, not just in the conversation, but their role in communities and investing in those communities. But there are a lot of organizations, large and small, uh, you know, that have not. Um, and there are a lot of folks who, who are really just, I hate to say it, but just waking up to kind of like what the impact of having uh, of, of investments in places means to their organizations. Um, there are a lot of folks even that do housing that, that really have not been invested in this bigger conversation about, you know, racial segregation and what that means. Like they've been doing their work kind of in their, in, in their part of the neighborhood, in their, in their piece of the you know, and, and the regions that they're in, but not really involved in this conversation. And so I feel like the, there's a real power in this moment of, and one of the beauties of this film, right? And lots of us having this conversation is getting people to sort of wake up about what that role could be. I'll give you a case in point. One of the organizations that we've been working with recently, nationally are the YMCAs. A lot of the YMCAs across the country, right? In addition to being the gyms that many of us go to and the after school programs that we go to, a lot of YMCA's actually own and operate housing. They do not see themselves as a housing organization. They have not been active on issues of housing. In fact, they, they have seen it traditionally as something, a conversation they don't wanna be a part of because they see it as contentious and those kinds of things. But they found themselves in this moment, right, of being one of the strongest housing partners across the country, right, especially for issues around homelessness or folks who are struggling with issues of addiction and those kinds of things. And so all of a sudden there's a moment when they're having this, a part of a, both an epiphany and reckoning, but also waking up as an organization. We are, right, a major player in almost every metropolitan area of the country. Many of our uh, organizations are doing this incredible work, but we're not in the, in the larger kind of struggle and fight for what it means to be thinking about this as a racial conversation as an issue of racial equity, as a bigger convert, as a social, social issue. And what does it mean for us to lean forward with other folks who are talking about these issues and working hard to address them in this context? I mean, that's huge, right? If those organizations like the YMCA's, realtors in the same way <laughs> are waking up to the right, 
they certainly have a role to play in you know segregation, but they also have a role to play as a huge body of folks who are the frontline workers of the housing industry, but they don't see themselves right in this conversation. They're starting to wake up to that. So I so I just think that you know the alignment of a wide range of stakeholders, not just large organizations and corporations or banks, but teachers associations and teachers unions and the law enforcement officers. There are lots of folks who who deeply touch right housing, um, and, and I would say just, just the communities in which they live, but they don't see themselves as part of the conversation. And this is an opportunity to get them in this conversation constructively. Those are those are uh, great points, uh, Tiffany. And it um, feeds into a question that we have uh, on uh, on Facebook. And I want to invite the uh, the audience, the folks uh, watching on YouTube and Facebook to post your questions, please. And Devon, I'm going to throw this out to you. Uh, what can you recommend as a solution in breaking down the systemic silos as the trust building with communities uh, is, is, is very much present? Given the position that you're in, what have you seen? What we've seen, and one of the things that we've, we, we aim to do firstly is to listen, right? I think what are, you know, we've learned that people who live and, and, are, and are you know carrying out their lives have very important things to teach us about what their needs are to teach us about things that we can be working toward and, and how to support them best. So it's important that we do that. And then the stakeholders, you know, we, one of the, the groups that we work with, of course, is, is, is philanthropy. And they play a key role in funding most of the initiatives that we roll out to support families. And what's been, you know, historically our experience is that there's always the questioning the you know the, the rethinking and overthinking what are the efforts what are the initiatives how do we get this moving what does it look like what is success etc and we just want to tell them to stop right you've got to trust that we are the eyes and ears so case in point years ago one of the things that we value clearly is education and we we clearly assessed that there are kids in new york city who are were matriculating the eighth grade and going into high schools where they had no idea what these high schools were about. They didn't know where they were. They didn't know what the graduation rates were. They knew nothing, but they were being sent there. And we thought it was important to kind of give them a grounding. And so we developed a program that helped six to eighth grade kids think more and be better prepared for high school. And we saw it funding. And I remember a meeting with one of our you know, very friendly uh, uh, funders where the question was asked to me, why is it $45,000? Seems so expensive. And I knew this woman enough to know that she had two kids who attended private school, you know, and each of them, she paid $45,000 a year to send them to her private school. But she questioned a program for which we were seeking $45,000 to help secure a better life for 128 kids in the middle school. So this is the kind of learning that we hope. I mean, you know, I've got to say this year has been a bit different. They have come to the table with a bit more grace and, and uh, willingness to listen. And I hope that continues because we need everybody to play a role in this. Well, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And how, how can you, how can you, how do you think you can get that type of behavior to continue? Because yeah, it, it's, it, we're in a, we're in a unique situation right now. I don't know. I mean, I honestly, you know, I, I, I heard Tiffany when she said, how long is this going to last? We hope it, it lasts for a very long time. And and my my private fear, knowing how this country has behaved for as long as it's been around, is the quick pivoting, right? We do that very well, right? The pandemic seems to be at its end, and we're pivoting, and we're talking about how we're going to spend all this money, right? And it's it's not good, and, and it's not treated us well. We, we keep being you know, you know put back in the same place we were at the beginning of every every one of these crises so we've got to keep the focus we've got to keep the the, the, the foot on the pedal well how can we get more people on board and understand the 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 importance of this issue uh you know make the argument getting people to move from saying 
you know, after see after reading about the situation or seeing this film and saying, oh, how horrible, but I didn't create the problem, or understanding that even if you aren't dealing with the issues addressed in the film because you live in, in, in Winnetka or Lower Marion or Pacific Heights or Gross Point or Scarsdale, it's still your problem. Well, Jason, I saw you nodding your head. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in here. The the uh, I, I don't have a lot of time, I, I, honestly, for the pushback that it's not my problem or when I, when I hear that from people, it, it, it's all of our problem. Some of us are just impacted more than others uh, or more visibly than others. What we found a, a, a good way of co connecting, and this kind of goes to the question about crossing into different silos, is that when you start connecting uh, issues to each other, the way that this film has kind of highlighted, it, it's a lot more effective at then getting people, it activates certain interests that individuals might have. Um, for example, our last report on, on the impact of redlining on, on, on uh, you know, health issues, we found we were working with Dr. Helen Meyer, who's with the University of Michigan, and she's an epidemiologist and a public health specialist. And that report and then some other work that we've done with her, she's going back and, and presenting this to committees of public health specialists. And they're thinking for the first time about housing and investment in housing, you know, in that way as being, inter you know, connected. And when you, it, it seems to be effective when you're able to connect your core issue that you're concerned with with multiple other issues. And then all of a sudden, you know, people, somebody who is interested in education, for example, might not really care that much about housing until you, talk, until you start talking about the way it impacts education and the way it impacts education across an entire system where when some schools are undervalued and un underinvested in some ways, they wind up sapping resources from the entire school system, right? So, so you know, if you can connect them that way, then, then people who are interested in education become more interested in, in resolving this root issue of segregation that we're talking about, right? And public health is, is, a, is another factor, you know, that the, the public health, you know, as you noted, you know, organizations like YMCA don't see themselves as a housing organization, but, but what they do is intimately related to housing. And when they start to understand that and you start to make those links and reinforce those links like this film does, I, you know, I, I think that's a good, that's a good start on crossing, you know, at breaking down those silos that the question uh, uh, speaks about. And Kendra, can you add to that? Yeah. I mean, I think Jason is spot on those cross sector partnerships that, being able to talk to partners and help them realize that you really cannot ignore the intersection of all of these issues. So even if I live in some of the, you know, the communities that you you mentioned previously in your intro to this question, right, high wealth, maybe not as diverse as, as we would like to see, there's still an impact there. And whether that is about jobs, whether that is I have a small business and I'm looking for opportunities or people to work in my small business, um, whether we think about schools and, and access to schools outside of communities and, and busing to schools, all of this is interrelated. And so I think whether that's through a community organization, whether that's through residents and block clubs, or whether it's through large organizations, if you aren't setting a cross-sector table for whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, I think you're really creating an uphill battle for people to understand and, and to kind of tie in, you know, to the work that we're hoping to see that we are hoping to, you know, uncover these disparities for folks that may not be aware. Um, but you got to bring other cross sector partners to the table to do that. Yeah, and just to pick back on that, I want to say it, that that there's one conversation to be had about bringing those sort of cross-sector partners together. I think about that as just kind of like building institutional will from the folks around the table. But the other part of that conversation, I think this is what Jason was getting at um, a little bit around, was building this, this broader sense of public will building. We have really fallen down on that. When you ask people, do they agree with the ideals of fair housing? Yes, we've been successful with that. People that they might not have said that in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was actually passed, but today you ask Americans, like, do you agree with the idea? And they can not only do they agree with the values and the ideas around fair housing, but they also, when you ask them if they can identify, you know, if you give them a set of scenarios, they can identify what are violations of the Fair Housing Act, right? Very explicitly. Oh, no, that by, that's a violation. No, it's not. So they understand the depths of at least at a high level with the kinds of behavior that violates kind of what we what we codified in law. Um, and, and then when you ask them, do they think that, you know, folks are struggling in communities, should we be doing more to help? Oh, absolutely, yes. But then when you ask the thornier questions, like, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to give up? Like, what are, 
What are the, are you willing to have, you know, housing in your neighborhood? All those kinds of things that, that add this additional layer, you get a whole set of issues that are pushed back, not just, right, they, not so much of the thinking about, I don't agree with fair housing, but I don't believe that government can do this, right? I just can't, we can really stop having this conversation about race already. We're, I'm sick of it, I'm tired. Did, did, did we, did we solve this in 1968? Just enforce the law. Like, what do you need? Like, what do we have? Why are we still having this conversation again and again and again, right? And so from our vantage point, the, the, the willingness of this group and others to make it plain about what are the things that you care about that are tied into our ability to shape, right? Um, a, a fair housing practices in our communities is really important because we are winning in the court system. We're winning in the sort of broader sense of the values, but we're losing in the everyday court of opinion in terms of how people are showing up, right? To mobilize around this mm -hmm. issue. Um, and, and, I, and I wanna say just, you know, this moment is an opportunity for us to begin to remind people about the power of what we can do together in part because we're doing it. You look at like mutual aid and what's happening across the country in terms of neighbors helping neighbors in this crazy moment. And we've been able to get, what is it, 200 million doses of vaccine like out the door efficiently. So for those folks who don't believe government can act right efficiently and thoughtfully, look at how fast we've been able to do this. Stimulus checks, the, the Congress passes the legislation on Tuesday, but Friday it's in your bank account. What, right? <laughs> homelessness, we have homelessness right. across the country, but the, COVID-19 happens and now we have hotels. We can we can pay to get them in hotels. What? what right. So if the will, yeah, if the will is there, then something exactly. can actually happen. And exactly. so I want to get to a question. Um, and Kate, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this to you. Uh, how are you working with the families or letting them lead the conversation to design uh, solutions for their neighborhoods? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have a series of community advisory groups that we've formed to really help one listen to drive strategy and drive investment. Um, and so we've done that in a few different neighborhoods. So really having residents at the table who are helping inform, drive that strategy, but ultimately um, both drive investment, but also accountability for those outcomes as well. And so really that engagement process um, is critical in, in both listening, showing up, but also transferring um, the ability to, to drive solutions, to drive strategy and ultimately invest and accountability for those investments as well. And so how, how are those community groups formed actually? Yeah, so through again, trust building. So we have folks door-to-door, uh, -door, a mix of AmeriCorps members. Um, we have individuals out in neighborhoods um, building relationships. Um, again, building trust. We use a lot of placemaking, so arts and culture. Um, so concerts and events and murals. Uh, we have bike ride programs. So really rooted in a sense of culture and community where we build relationships, invite folks to the table, and then again, help um, to really craft the solutions and the investments and the accountability as well. And so you're, you all are, you all are feeling good about this moment, right? I mean, are there some final thoughts on, on what each of us can actually do to move the needle here? You know, I think it's a, it's a great moment. I think we have to continue to check in at all levels, right? There's real value in this work at the grassroots level. There's real value in this work from government, from organizations. But if those efforts are not starting to be integrated into each other, introduced to each other, we're still working in silos. And it just may be a different type of silo, but it's still a silo. And so I think, you know, when we hear everybody, you know, tonight talking about I think we lost the connection there. You know, uh, Tiffany, I want to toss this one to you, and I think uh, we're, we're we're running out of time here. How do you bring or encourage uh, those families with lived experience to come to the table? Because interestingly enough, in the film, you talked about that that disconnect about well, what do I see in an ideal community, and what what's actually in mine. Well, you know what? I think there. I think uh, I, I want to reorient the question a little bit because I don't think we're having trouble bringing people with lived experience to the table. They're at the table. What we've been having trouble is having other people listen to people with lived experience, right? And not just listen so that like we get their story in some newspaper article or some case study that we're doing, but listen and then respond in a way that 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 is very thoughtful in terms of policy and that structures the investment, that structures how we work together, right? so that they understand that they're not speaking into the wind for the sake of it, right? But, they, but their voices are being heard in a way that's changing the dynamics at the table. So I think it's not a matter of 
of them convincing them to have their voices heard. It's convincing lots of the institutions that do this work, right, to make sure their voices are heard. And I think the other piece about this, when we think about ha about having folks share their lived experience, it's it's not for the for the sheer sake of voyeurism, which is a lot of what we see happening. Like you know, in many of the newspapers, you know, like the the standard journalistic format is you start with a story about Tanisha in you know. Brooklyn or Bedford Stuy, you know, and blah blah blah, and Tanisha, and, th and then you pan out to say nationally, you know, there's lots of Tanishas, da 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 da, and then you go back at the end of the story to like end with what happened to Tanisha, and like that, it that's like journalistic voyeurism. That is not about how we mobilize people and how we understand the resilience and the opportunities for investment in people's well-being. And so I think we have to relearn right how to listen differently and reflect people's story back in a way that mobilizes folks, not that. That 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 um, that accuse that up for voyeurism, right? Yeah. Well, so uh, you know, I, I'm a, I'm a recovering journalist actually, and so I have to ask: is there is there is there a uh, is there room for that? Because maybe people just connect that way when they have um, the, they'll feel that they have more of a personal co connection uh, with a person that they're reading about, and maybe that will get them to act in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, and so 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 my my issue is not that that we're not pulling those personal stories; it's that we're not we're not pulling those stories in a way that mobilizes folks for action, and we're not pulling those stories in a way that that cues up the resilience of people. It's what it's Tanisha's story and all the things that are wrong with what's happening in Tanisha's life, not the ways that Tanisha and everybody in her network have been resilient in the face of some crazy odds, right? So, so let's talk about that. And the question is, how do we scale and invest in the resilience of folks in community? So I gotta see what that is, but but that's not the way that it's typically talked about because that doesn't make the front page of the New York Times, right? See, Tanisha only makes the front page of the New York Times if there's something awful happening right around her. Um, and we can put that visually on, on, on the front page. And you know, that's not to knock journalism, but it is to say that we've gotten used to this kind of voyeurism, right? and not a real sense of listening to folks who understand best how to think about their own communities and, and, and the kinds of things that would be worthy of their investment, right? Um, and of our investment, I would say. Well, you, you highlight something very important. There's just, there's so many moving parts, it seems to, to, to actually uh, tackle, but it's, it still can be done. As, as you said, you know, we created these systems, so we, we made these systems so we can actually unmake them. It just, uh, will it, it? It takes a lot. Uh, so the um, I, how you know I, I often think of um, the younger generation. How can we get them to understand that you know engage them because this involves them. You talk about you're talking about uh, school and the communities that they live in. How can we get more younger people involved? And and Devon, you and I serve on the board of an organization in the Bronx that uh, works with young people. Uh, what's what's your thoughts on engaging young people? And Tiffany, we'll go to you after that too because it, you're not. I see you nodding your head. Just a a, a quick uh, and 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 apt story. You know about the board. There was a board meeting last night. And uh, a high school senior uh, presented on her time at school. And more importantly, she presented on uh, what is now viewed as her graduation thesis. And here's a young woman who Brown has lived in the Bronx all her life. And from what I gather from the story she was telling, she moved away from the Bronx recently. And in moving away from the Bronx, coupled with the pandemic and all of the people that she knew who she lost, because of it and how it ravaged the neighborhood where she lived before made her go back and do more and understand more about the social determinants that we're talking about. And she yeah. penned a paper entitled, My Neighborhood is Killing Me. And the response from board members was, those of us who do not live in 10452, who live you know, Soho, in lower Manhattan, whatever, we need to take this and be teaching it to our children. And I think that's got to be a place where we go with this. Now, there will be backlash as we're, we're seeing in New York with the private school movement, right? Independent schools are doing more with anti-racism 
and the backlash has been fierce, right? People have lost their jobs on account of this. So I don't know. There's the promise and then there's the reality that we have to balance. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just add to that. I think you know, the, and when I'm thinking about any given day in terms of the work that I do, I, the day part of the day when I'm most excited is when I'm talking to young people, and the part of the day when I'm most depressed is when I'm talking to young people <laughs> because of the challenges of folks. But I, but what I'll say to us as I think of us as old fogies on this conversation is, you know, we have got to get out of our our very sort of uh, you know just old world thinking about how to reach right young people and to lift up their voices. You know, when you look at the number one platform, the number one place where young people get their public affairs information today, it ain't MSNBC, right? It ain't even Facebook, right? It's TikTok, for God's sakes. I was like, right? How many of us are on TikTok, right? That's where they're getting their information. And so what I would say, if that's where they're getting their information, like, right, let's think through how do we engage them to share the kinds of information that will be helpful. And what you just talked about, Devon, lifting that up and lifting their voices up. Now I got, I have two sons, you know, teenagers, and I get on that TikTok and that, I, it gives me a headache. I, I, I can't understand it. I don't understand it, but they do, right? Jeremy Himes and teams wrote this a, a book a couple years ago or two years ago called New Power, right? Hyperconnected World, the the world that, that we are facing, right? Especially for young folks, the power, right? Is being shared, right? Electronically in these digital places. If we are not in those digital places, we will not have the ability to influence the next generation and lift up their voices, right, in a way that we think is thoughtful. So all that, all that to say is just a plug for getting us old fogies, all <laughs> platforms that we probably would otherwise, oh boy, <laughs> I mean, not be on. <laughs> so we're joining TikTok. I think that's our takeaway, right? <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, all of us old fogies have to learn how to use the TikTok, I guess. So, uh, well, or should we, we call it the TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Well, I want to um, I want to thank you all uh, for uh, participating in the Q and A uh, this evening. This is this has been fast, fantastic. There is a lot to learn. Do any of you have um, websites that you want to promote really quickly? That people can go to to learn more more information. Sure, I'm happy to do that. W, that we have uh, thecasemade.com. Lots of information there for those who are interested. Wetco.org. Okay. W h e d c o dot o r g. Learn about our 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 work in the Bronx across New York City. Yeah, for Toledo, um, we are at bsmh.org slash community programs, and it's um, a good way to get connected with our local folks um, here in Toledo. And promedica.org, um, Facebook, uh, not TikTok yet, Instagram, uh, all the social media <laughs> yeah, the platforms, but TikTok is soon to come. Well, Kate, you let us know when you actually make it to TikTok, right? <laughs> uh, ncrc.org. Obviously, and, and yes, we're on all the socials. Uh, uh, I am not aware if we're on TikTok or not, so I'll ask. Well, thank you very much. And with that, we will wrap things up. Thank you, panelists Jason Richardson, Dr. Tiffany Manuel, Devon Russell, Kendra Smith, and Kate Summerfield. Thank you also to Sarah Jenkins, who helped put this event together, and to executive producer Will Lucas's team at Credio, Andre Lewis, and Bobby Brumfeld, and Robbie Brumfield, that is. Whatever you took down in your, note, your notes, people, be sure to visit zipcodematters.com, share the link, help us get the message out that uh, we can undo what we made. And with that, I'm Erickson Blakeney. Good night.